Welcome to a new edition of New Energy for Europe, a regular news program that gives an insight into the emerging hydrogen economy in and around Europe. In this bulletin, we're looking at clean zero emission hydrogen for direct use in the built environment as an energy carrier to heat homes, offices and other buildings. Using the macro and micro gas infrastructure that is already present in many cases, it's a solution that's getting more and more momentum. Making houses fossil free is a tremendous challenge. In the electricity sector, you need some monster miracle, a new green revolution. In general, it looks like electrifying as many buildings as possible is a proper option making them fit for all electric cooking and heating. And here it is, the new Daikin Thermo 3 MR32 monoblock. Always in combination with perfect insulation. But for many existing buildings, this is often too complex or too expensive. Now there's an interesting alternative. Hydrogen is the most effective way to store energy in the whole universe. A Dutch village called Stad Anadharing Fleet plans to make a full transition to hydrogen. It is the intention to heat these buildings with hydrogen before 2025. We are here in an uh, old village, many old buildings, and with old buildings it's not so easy to make the energy transition using uh, electric uh, uh, heat pumps or, or heating networks. The buildings are spread apart, it's costly to install heating networks, so hydrogen could be a very interesting option here. The idea is to have green hydrogen produced with electricity from nearby wind and solar parks and transported to individual houses through the existing gas network. And uh, transforming that uh, network to hydrogen transport, that's an option. And studies have shown that it's very well possible and that's not very expensive. That would make start an adhering fleet fossil free in one fell swoop. The question when and how to modify pipelines for future hydrogen use is a very topical one. It is on the agenda in various European countries. To give you an example, in this cross-border area covering parts of France, Germany and Luxembourg, grid operators are converting two existing pipelines into a 70 kilometre pure hydrogen infrastructure. The organisation in charge of these issues, ENSOG, is established in Brussels. The role of the European Network of Transmission System Operators for Gas is to facilitate and enhance cooperation between the national operators across Europe to ensure the development of a pan-European transmission system in line with European Union energy goals. We are the European Network of Transmission System Operators for Gas. So what is ENSOC uh, doing since it was created in 2009? Uh, it is uh, delivering the uh, security of supply, the competitiveness and the sustainability of the European gas networks. And my team and, and, and colleagues working for all the business areas in ENSOC are preparing for this sustainability agenda. So how can operators support the transport of low carbon gases in the existing network? A very interesting option is to make them fit for hydrogen, either in pure form or blended with methane and biomethane. Right now we are discussing the geography of these changes, so where the first hydrogen production centers will be localized, how the uh, existing gas grids be used to uh, connect those centers with the new emerging demand centers. And I think what is important is what kind of investment are needed to prepare the grids for this for this hydrogen revolution. However, some organizations are worried about this development and strongly advise not to rely on the direct use of hydrogen as a way of heating buildings on a large scale. They are in favor of prioritizing available and efficient, sustainable solutions to decarbonize Europe's buildings. Vlasius Oikonomou, Managing Director at the Institute for European Energy and Climate Policy Foundation, IEECP, remains sceptical about hydrogen. One of the issues that we could think about is the risks behind hydrogen. So it's about the hazard uh, due to the flammability. Um, but still, these things are, need to be proven. Eh? We don't, we are not sure yet and we are not secure yet. So the IEECP suggests that safety is still an issue. Moreover, there's another frequently heard argument against using hydrogen, the loss of efficiency. The opponent, let's say, of the hydrogen would say that indeed we can lose, we can waste a lot of renewable energy for its production because um, hydrogen from renewable energy to heat buildings 
is about I think uh, three to four times I say less energy efficient, uh, less energy efficient compared to using heat pumps uh, to supply heating in buildings. But Oikonomu's main concern is the risk of a so-called lock-in effect with hydrogen. Lock-in means making the energy system and its clients too dependent on one technology. Natural gas in the end killed energy efficiency, just to say it bluntly. Several countries addicted to natural gas did not invest on in energy efficiency, so they had artificially high energy demand without being able to invest on in it. And that's the first worry. And the second one that I would definitely consider is that as we assume that all risks are taken out from hydrogen, then that the energy efficiency first principle before moving to any type of new grid and any type of new infrastructure is respected. Chris Hellinga, hydrogen expert at Delft University of Technology, is about to publish an analysis based on scientific research that exactly addresses all of these issues. We asked him to comment on some of them. To start with, since the disaster with the Hindenburg Zeppelin in 1937, many people regard hydrogen gas as too risky an option to work with. The real experts that know about hydrogen uh, don't estimate the risk for hydrogen uh, higher than for natural gas. It's, it's more or less the same. Uh, and, and what we should not forget is that we had hydrogen in our homes 60 years ago. We uh, used then city gas, and city gas consists of 50% of hydrogen. So we had it in our homes, but uh, yeah, nowadays it's different. OK, it may be safe, but isn't it true that a lot of energy is lost during production? There is a point over there, but house owners are not interested in energy efficiency. They are interested in what will it cost. Uh, if you look at the total infrastructure in the Netherlands and you divide it by millions of homes that are connected to hydrogen, you talk about, um, let's say, something like 200 euros per building. So translate that in a monthly cost and it, it's 5 to 10 euros per, per month or something like that. But of course you have to add the costs of the equipment and of hydrogen itself. And studies show that if you add all the costs, uh, hydrogen heating is cheaper than heating with the alternatives in many of the neighborhoods in the Netherlands. Last but not least, the concerns about a lock-in effect. Will hydrogen for households create a new undesirable dependency? Uh, you don't have to think in terms of one solution. So be careful to remove your uh, natural gas network. Um, if the first boilers come on the market that are also available for hydrogen, so you can first use them for natural gas and later for hydrogen, well, put such boilers in, in, in your homes. Um, see, see it as a plus on existing plans. Do now what is possible, what you can do to 2030, but be open uh, for yeah, m more uh, new developments. Also, the system operators, ENSOG, are dealing with these concerns. But according to Sara Piska, technology can provide solutions. Look, we know, we know those arguments. We, we are discussing also with NGO community, with civil society organizations who are maybe voicing these concerns. And there's uh, very rightfully so the, the space to and, and the time indeed to address those. But I think right now we are uh, at the disposal of technologies that can support us in addressing them. There's a lot already going on. In different places in Europe, policymakers and companies are actively planning clean hydrogen production sites. Besides, some producers are already bringing hydrogen-ready furnaces and boilers to the market. We TSOs on our side, what we are doing to support this is uh, we are preparing the grids to be smarter to be uh, more prepared for dealing with different gas qualities. We are changing our chromatographs, we are changing our equipment, and we are adapting the grids in order to be able to support the tra transition from natural gas to those uh, blends or a pure hydrogen. I think technology-wise, uh, technology we are able to cope with majority of this concern and address them effectively. We're joined now by Noe van Hulst, Chair of the International Partnership for Hydrogen and Fuel Cells in the Economy. Mr. van Hulst, welcome to the program. Should the EU give this backbone priority? In my view, it should be really one of the top priorities for the European Commission. 
uh, and the European Union uh, as a whole, so including, of course, the member states, to make this happen and to create this, uh, this hydrogen backbone. And now the good news really is that uh, there is a very concrete plan on the table from uh, 10 infrastructure, European infrastructure companies, including Gazuni, um, but many other European ones who say uh, and who outline and even show with a lot of uh, illuminating maps how this can be done in, in different phases between now and the next 15 years. And my plea would be that the Commission, the European Commission uh, and the member states embrace this plan so that we can transport this hydrogen across Europe. Does the bottleneck then lie in the expenses? Because it sounds like a very costly plan. You know, it's not a matter of money. Uh, in ter terms of, uh, you know, the funding for, for this uh, hydrogen backbone is really uh, not a big problem. This can be taken forward and uh, it can, can go very fast. I think in 10, 15 years time, and uh, maybe even faster, we should be able to have a really serious, significant capacity of hydrogen backbone uh, uh, being able to transport this. Uh, You're also advising GasUni, an energy network operator in the Netherlands and northern part of Germany. Just last weekend, its top executive, Han Frenema, said that GasUni wants to invest 3.5 billion euros in green hydrogen. He also said that regional hydrogen backbone could be realized within five years. It will start probably in northwestern Europe, this, uh, this backbone uh, development. So uh, this will be the capacity that can be used for uh, a very important uh, big project at North H2, which is being developed by Shell, Gazony, RWE and Equinor. So they can transport, they can use this uh, basically obsolete or uh, unused pipeline capacity to transport the green hydrogen to customers in the Netherlands and even also in, in Germany. Still, it seems that behind the scenes there's an interesting debate going on about the pros and cons of the emerging hydrogen economy. We came across some of that resistance earlier on in this program. What do you think about that? Um, my take on it, and, and, and this is not only my personal take, but, you know, having discussed this with uh, many experts and many companies, is that uh, clean hydrogen is basically where solar and wind were 10, 15 years ago. Uh, so we are at the beginning of that, the big scaling up, it's going to be happening uh, 10, 15 years uh, from now. But of course, yes, there is still a lot of debate on, on yes, but, uh, you know, how big is it going to be? Uh, where are we going to use it exactly? You know, this is, nor this is kind of part of the game, if, if, you, want to, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and again, if the willingness is there from the European Union and the member states involved to also put in public money, uh, this can be taken forward and uh, it can... can go very fast. Thank you so much for joining the program, Noe van Holst. Yes, yes. Thanks for watching. Within one or two weeks, you can expect our next edition. Sign up on the website to be notified about this and drop your ideas for future newscasts. This is newenergyforeurope.com.